Okay, so one of the other comments that I'm going to make right off the bat is that I am recording this. I will more than likely be able to post this, I'm hoping, at the end of the day to my YouTube channel. Um, when that posts and it's live, I'm going to go ahead and probably email the group again with a link to that URL so that everyone has it. And uh, we'll make sure that I will try my best to make sure that those emails go out in a timely manner. You may not see that email till Monday, give or take, but I'd like to try and get this posted as soon as possible after the question and answer session. More than likely, the question and answer session will be recorded as well. But at the end of the session, the part that'll take me the longest is I'm probably going to cut that off and just post this session itself. If the questions that happen in that question and answer session are important, they're going to drive the next lecture. And the other statement that I want to make right off the bat is this is totally informal. This is not meant to be an absolute uh, um, formal lecture. I'm not grading people. There's no real assignments. Later on, we may do some uh, um, exercises and things like that. But this is really meant to be the ability to uh, uh, kind of share knowledge. And initially, it'll be a lot of me talking to you all, but I'm sure over time, it'll become a more dynamic, interactive thing. So let's go ahead and get started. One of the first things that people will notice, and one of the things that I think is critical important in an organization of this size and in any organization in general, is that software being up to date is kind of important. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my Arc Pro. And in the upper right hand corner, when this launches, you're going to see a little drop down pop down. And it's letting us know that there's an update available. Literally the day after we had everyone's software up to date, Esri released a patch. For the most part, this isn't that big of a deal. Everyone being on the same version is important, but it's not the end all be all. My statement is going to be just feel free to ignore this until we deem it necessary to go ahead and do another update. Um, so currently everyone should be on version 3.2.1 and you can check that by clicking on the settings and you'll see up at the top 3.2.1. It'll also let you know what patch release is available. The important part is if you happen to do a software update yourself, it's not the worst thing in the world. Many of you have admin privileges to your computers. There's nothing wrong with that, especially your laptops. If you happen to update, it's not that big of a deal with one extremely major exception, and that is compatibility. There, Esri currently states that if they do a major release, so this three is the major release, this two is the minor release, this two is the patch. The part we need to not do is make sure that no one goes to a major release before the entire bureau goes. That will create a problem. They claim, they Esri claims that minor releases and patches are intercompatible and reverse compatible. Um, I would prefer not to test that <laughs> because uh, those incompatibilities can create issues with uh, collaborative workers and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that everyone basically stays on the same version of the software. So if it happens, it's not the worst thing in the world, but currently everyone should be on 3.2.1. If you're on a different version, if you're on two point something, we need to make sure that you get up to date. If you do happen to do a patch or a minor release, don't worry about it, but let's try and keep everyone together for that compatibility discussion. Okay, so we've covered software updates. Now I wanna go ahead and talk about the process of importing a project into Pro and terminology. You know, we're so familiar with calling these MXDs. And currently the working terminology for ARC is they're calling these new things projects. And the reason why is because it's no longer just a single map and a single layout. You can contain an entire project and multiple maps in one project. So we're gonna call these projects now. One of the most common things that is gonna happen early on in these early days is we're gonna wanna take our MXDs and start working on them in pro. The reason why is because Esri is terming the licenses on us and we won't have access to ArcMap. We're in negotiations for extending ArcMap for one more year. 
And I think that is going to happen, but we have to have some timing happen on campus sooner rather than later. And it's got to happen at critical points so that Esri will go ahead and authorize us to extend our license for ArcMap for one more year. Um, that is not guaranteed, but that is in the works. So with that software terming, everybody's got to update all of their projects to become pro projects instead of MXDs. So typically we know we have the MXD. You'll commonly have a geo database or shape files where your data lives that you're going to put into your projects, into your MXDs. You'll have style files, you'll have layer files that you're working from. So this is that typical set of files that we see in a project. Fundamentally, when we import a project, in, when we import an MXD into Pro and convert it to a project, there's a whole bunch of extra files that come in here. And there's a couple different specialized ways that we kind of need to deal with that problem. So what I'm going to do right off the bat is show you how easy it is to import a project into an MXD into Pro as a project. When you open ArcMap, it always pulls up this splash screen. And for the most part, when you have projects that you're already working on, you can select from the list of projects that you're working on. There's nothing wrong with that. But how do you get a project that was an MXD in? So we want to start that process by starting without a template. So you go ahead and click the start without a template. When we go into later discussions of uh, projects on future uh, uh, informal lecture series, more than likely what we'll do with this is we'll actually build one of these projects from scratch by starting with a map or a scene or something like that. But this, this lecture and probably the next lecture will probably be a repeat of this one is just going to be about how do we get that MXD into Pro. So it has opened up. And we now have basically a blank template to start working from. So the very first thing that we're going to want to do is we'll notice that we open up on the insert tab with the ribbon at our disposal for insert. And you can see right off the bat, one of the first things is import map. And that's what we want to do. We want to go ahead and import the map. And the help tells us that we can import an MXD, a package, and a couple of different other things into this project to start off. So I'm going to go ahead and click Import Map. And then it's going to open a browser to allow me to navigate to the project that I want to import. So you would navigate to your project. Here is the folder that we were looking at here. The exception is, is ARC recognizes that I'm trying to pull in specific files. So it recognizes only the import for the MXD. So I'm going to click the MXD and click open. What this does is it grabs all of the layer files, the layer properties, the data reference location, the metadata, the MXD layout, any of the configuration files, any grids that we've set up, any labeling properties, it pulls all of that in and does a decent job of converting that to a pro project. There are some gotchas, there are some weird caveats, and it has to stem from the fact of um, how ArcMap handled uh, different syntax things in like labeling functions. Not everything translates perfectly is what I'm getting at. Most things come in operational. The part that's really nice is Esri has done a fairly good job at uh, alerting you to things that did not import well. So you'll end up seeing like little dialog box down here at the bottom of your window and it'll have a little stop sign in red and it'll have a number in there and it lets you know how many errors there are. Um, all of your maps will have this if you enter, enter, if you enter any data and happen to create an error with that. Um, this process does take a little bit, but it's not too long. The more data you have in here, the more elements that you have in here, the longer this process will take. You can also tell, and I stopped before I could get there, this was spinning while the elements are still rendering. So that's another thing to be aware of. The more information you have in here, the longer it will take for this to stop spinning, letting you know that it's ready. 
So now you can start working on this MXD. We now have a pro project. That is literally how easy it is. The caveat is where things are saved now. Currently importing this project into a template, we'll see that our folder says we're in an untitled project. What we'll want to do is get all of that information to the actual folder location that we want it. So you can see currently it went ahead and went to my user profile, uh, a hidden folder called app data, local temp ArcGIS Pro temp 23772 untitled. That's where it unpackaged this for and staged this to be set up. We'll also notice that um, there are a few things in here that are a little tricky. So if I expand databases in my catalog, we can see that I've only got my default geo database. This is one of the other gotchas that I think is an interesting comment to make about Pro. No matter which project you open or do, whether you're importing or you're generating one, from scratch, you're always going to get a default.gdb. This is new. This hasn't happened in ArcMap. So this is one of those things that just comes in. And one of the things that I tend to do is I've got default geodatabases that I want to work from, and I've got scratch geodatabases that I want to work from. So one of the first things that I do is I go ahead and I want to add a database. And what I'm going to do is navigate to my project folder where my database exists. And the reason why is I can't make this not be a home default geodatabase without another database coming in. You always have to have a home geodatabase. So if I go ahead and click OK, I have now added that in. Now I can remove this, but it will not let me remove it because that is the default geodatabase. That is the home geodatabase. So to start off, if we don't want this to show up anymore, we actually have to set a different default geodatabase. So what I do is I tend to right click, set it as to set it to, sorry, set the settings to make it my default by clicking make default. Now you see that home geodatabase button switch, and now I can remove this geodatabase from the project. Now I don't have that. And if we come back over here, when I actually save my project in here, that geodatabase then won't come in because it's not part of the project. That default geodatabase will still exist in that untitled folder, in that hidden folder, the app data folder. I'm going to go ahead and also add in my Scratch geodatabase. Now that I've got that configured, now would be a good time to go ahead and save the Pro project because we've set our default geodatabase. We've gotten rid of the temporary default geodatabase that will show up in every project. And we'll talk about all the other things that show up in this project later on. So I'm going to go ahead and click Save Project. And this is going to be weird to people. And the reason why this is weird is I'm going to go into T, Taylor Well, Map Elements, Arc. I've got my Arc folder. And currently, it's asking me where I want to save this project into what folder. If I name this Taylor Well, I'm going to get another Taylor Well folder in here. And it's problematic because then you'll have a Taylor Well folder in a Taylor Well folder. And the reason why I am talking about this and why I don't like this is Esri is forcing a folder structure on its users, not allowing users to use their existing folder structures. So this process is a slight workaround for getting around that. So I'm going to name my project Arc. And I know that's weird, but it's because I don't want it to create another folder. I want to save it within this folder. So I click Save. And you're going to see up here, it's going to call this project, now Arc. And we'll see that my folder 
default folder is now called arc, and we can see that it's in that Taylor Well map elements arc folder. Okay, so I've saved the project, and there's a few things that I want to do now. So I'm going to close this down because we saved the APRX, the ARC project, in this folder. So now we can see there's the ARC project. We can also see that we got an untitled index that came in, an ARC index that came in, our default geodatabase came back, an import log uh atbx file yeah and that's it these are the files that we just wrote into that we just wrote to the hard drive when we saved this project so one of the things that we'll want to do now is actually change our project to be named appropriate for the project so i'm going to call this Taylor well. And you'll notice that the associated index with ARC as well came in. We can go ahead and name this too. You don't have to, but ARC will make a new index folder when you open up this project. So you might as well go ahead and let it use the existing ARC underscore index as the ARC as the uh, index folder that it's going to write files to. Um, and I'm not going to get into what the index is and what the import log is. And uh, the untitled index is from when we initially had our untitled project. This is that index file. So now we go ahead and we can open up. Well, and I guess the other statement is you could now delete this default geodatabase. You don't have to, but you could get it out of the mix if you didn't want it. So now I'm going to go ahead and check my notes to make sure I did everything that I was intending to do. Rename the index. And now we can open the TaylorWell APRX. That APRX file extension is the ARC project. So from now on, we'll no longer be saying MXDs unless you're me. I'll be saying MXD until I die. We are going to open the APRX, the ARC Pro project. When we open up that project now, it's going to do all of the work that we had done. We can now see that our project name is Taylor Well. Everything came in exactly as it was. If we expand the databases, we can see that my default was remembered and my scratch was a favorite that was added to this. If we open the folders, we can see that now my ARC folder is one of those nested folders within. We can see that that's the default geodatabase. And now we can see this same folder of information here that we see in ARC catalog. Okay, I wanna pause right there really quick because that was a lot of information. Are there any questions on what we just did there that relates to importing the project? Because there's a few other things that I want to do to get a project kind of set up and ready to start working on. Cool, awesome. And as you can see, this is actually fairly easy to work with. The other thing that's really nice about this is we can go ahead and do a few more things like go to analysis. I've got a scratch geodatabase. So I might as well go to analysis, environments. We can see that my current workspace is my TaylorWell default geodatabase. That's what we did earlier on was we set it as the default. I can go ahead now and set my scratch geodatabase as well. And this is one of the things that I kind of like about Pro is that uh, when you open things up like this, a lot of the information that's in your catalog will show up in the uh, browser as well. So I can go to my folders, I can click on ARC, and I can go ahead and add my Taylor Well Scratch geodatabase. This doesn't operate exactly like go to home folder or go to home geodatabase like it did in ARC map, right? It's not exactly the same, but there is kind of the comparison analog process here. So your project 
settings are really a nice way to do things. A lot of the times I tend to mostly just work in this anymore because I've got a few things that I've set to every project. We'll go into that in a future lecture series of how to set all of the folders that you want to show up automatically for every project or how to make them project specific. So I'm going to continue with setting my scratch default geo, my scratch geo database so that when I'm geo processing those temporary files get wrote to the scratch and then my geo database is my default geo database. Now that we've done that, we've set our environments, it's a good idea to go ahead and click save so that we can write that that is now the scratch geo database for this project that is a project specific setting. Okay, so we noticed that instead of opening in like a, a data view in ArcMap, we imported this project and it immediately went to layout view. So the question should follow then, how do we edit data in this project? Well, we like ArcMap, we need to be in data view, not layout view. Okay, that's kind of a lie, but it's definitely the easier way to do it because there are things you can do in this layout view. I do not recommend it. What I do recommend is you want to open up what we used to call the, um, oh, I just drew a blank on what it's called now. We call them maps now. What are they? Amy? Map frame. Data frame. Thank you. Data map, frame. Map, yeah, map frames, <laughs> data frames. Sorry, I have been immersed in Arc Pro for a while now. I'm forgetting old terminologies except for MXD. Um, so we want to open a data frame. So there's, as with everything that has always been true with Arc, you can open a data frame 8 billion different ways. I clicked on the data frame, the map. See, now I'm doing it. I clicked on the map, right clicked. I can open it from here. But the other thing to note is that in your project, in your catalog, in catalog, in your project folder, in your project tab, you can expand the maps folder. These are all of the maps, all of the data frames that existed in that MXD. If you double click on one, it opens up the map and you can fundamentally see the difference between the map now and the layout. So this is how you enter into data view. If you're familiar with ArcMap, this is how we enter data view and we can open up any number of these. The part that I really like about this as well is, let's say I'm only gonna work on this map now. Well, that's great. I can close all of these. You'll notice they didn't go away. They're not gone. They're just out of the current pane. We have the ability to open up panes and views. So there's lots of different functionality that is built in here now that operates different than ArcMap does. But most of the functionality, and the lesson that I can give as the take home is everything, almost everything that you could do in ArcMap is absolutely capable of doing in Arc Pro. There's a few exceptions and there's a few circuitous routes that you have to get to those things, but basically all of the functionality is finally in Arc Pro. Okay, so that takes care of how to open maps. The other way you can open a map is come to your layout and you can see now that we've got physical boxes in our table of contents that we can select elements. This is a very nice function. I am so glad that they've incorporated this because before you'd have to be on the layout and click the correct thing in the layout. And if you had uh, features, uh, elements stacked on top of each other, you'd have to click through the stack. Now you can click on these and actually rename them to be what they are. So that now you have the elements at your fingertips, but you can also give them more information than just text box nine. If we continue to scroll down through things, we can see now we've got that icon again that looks like the map icon. We can look at the contents of that map by expanding it and see what's in that table of contents or what's in that, what, what the contents of that map are. So if we wanted to look at the map itself, we come down here, expand that. These are all of the grid settings on this map. 
This is the map window itself, and these are the layers within that map. And just like we could um, in layout view in Arc Map, we can turn layers on, off, do whatever we want. We can also switch over to here, turn things off. When we come back to the layout, we notice that that effect happened on the map as well. So these are now kind of interrelated and dynamic elements, much like they were in map, but there's kind of an easier interface for this in my personal opinion. Okay, uh, so that's the maps. Let's talk about the table of contents. Let's keep going through the list. We also have toolboxes. I'm not going to get into the gist of this uh, in too much detail for the toolboxes, but you can set up each project, you could have a specific toolbox. So if we wanted just a geologic mapping program toolbox that eliminated 99% of the tools that the mappers never use, we could have a toolbox that has, you know, featured a polygon. Um, that's one of the main ones that the mappers use. But we could make a subset of tools so that you don't have to wade through the entire list of ArcGIS toolboxes. And notice you can set a default home toolbox as well. So you can add one in and right click on something and um, uh, make it the default. And like everything, if you right click on any of these, you can add a toolbox, you can add a map, you can add a scene, you can add a stereo map for the photogrammetry people. You'll be getting very comfortable with this new stereo map function when we get to that phase. You can add database connections. You can view all of your layouts. And this is what I mentioned earlier in brief passing. You can have more than one layout now. This is the part that I really like about Pro is they have turned this into a project environment, not a single map environment. So I can easily right click, add a new layout. I now have new layout settings. I can come to my layout and go ahead and configure whatever I wanted to from page sizes, and orientations, um, I can set color management functions so that if I wanted it to be RGB because it's gonna be a web map only, or I need it to be CMYK because it's gonna be print, you can set all of these settings and know that we now have two layouts in this project that you can jump back and forth between. The other part that's nice about this is I can easily take an existing map and add it to the geologic map at this default setting. And I'm going to add it here. Oops, wrong way. Now I've added that map in with all of those settings pre configured. Uh, to the layout, sorry, I've added that map to this new layout. If I close this, notice the layout doesn't go away. I still have the ability to get access to it. I can open it up, make changes. So things don't go away. Just because you close it doesn't mean it's gone. You still have access to it. And if you are, uh, if, if you open a temporary layout, do some tweak to something, it has served its purpose. It's just as easy to go ahead and delete that uh, temporary layout or rename it or whatever the case may be. Many of our maps have style files associated with them. So I also wanted to go into the process of importing a style file into a project. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that folder where I was at. Let's go ahead and open that location. So we can see that I've got the FGDC gems style file that we've been using for as long as I've been here now, um, and a project specific style file. You will note that these are not style X files. These are the old version of a style file. So what we'll want to do is go to insert styles import. I'm gonna to navigate to my folder. Great, 
I'm here, projects, park map, they show up so that you can still have access to them, but they are not in the current Arc Pro format. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my gems one, click OK, give it a little bit. Normally this doesn't take the, uh, there it is. And now I have my um, style file as an style dot X. So that import process converted this style file into the new style format. The other part that's nice about this is if you double click on it, it goes ahead and opens a catalog. Is this the pane or the view? I think this is the view. 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 Thank you. So it's opened the catalog view. This is the catalog pane. What a pain. Anyway. Um, and you'll see that if I open and expand this, I can now look at all of the symbols that are available to me. And we can navigate color schemas. We can then work with this style file instead of having to go to a whole different interface, open up the style window itself. We end up having a new style view to be able to edit whatever we need to. And we can add and import from here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and import that other project specific to show how easy it is to navigate these things. I didn't have to go to insert, find the style portion of the ribbon interface. I can directly add it from catalog. This catalog is actually, in my opinion, the more and more I've used Pro, the more and more I rely on this. This has become basically my central hub of operation. And again, the same is true. If I double click, it switches over to the catalog pane and I can work with the colors that are in that pane, in that style file, sorry. Okay, and then folders. So by default, when you make an Arc Pro project, you will always get in the project folder. And I'm gonna say that again, you get the project folder. Effectively, Esri is now trying to enforce that all elements of a project go into that folder. No, you don't have to, but commonly this folder is where your default geodatabase would have been wrote to when we clicked save early on. If we hadn't changed that default, it would make this now default geodatabase be your home geodatabase. This is your home, and that's the reason why it has the home icon on it. Your project folder becomes the hub, the central location of the vast majority of your data, settings, layers, project elements, for lack of a better word. But a lot of the times, this project folder, specifically I'm gonna talk about the geologic mapping program. What if I wanted to add the, uh, let's say a hill shade to this project. We don't save, this is our folder structure. So again, this is a little more specific to the mappers themselves, but this is the example that I'm gonna give that talks about why we might want to add other folders. So if I want to add the raster uh, of a hill shade, um, let's pick on, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pick on someone. Hey, Dan. What folder do we save rasters in in our geologic mapping projects? We save it in uh, repository arc rasters. Repository rasters. Absolutely. The problem is, is, is repository rasters in this home folder? No, it is not. So there is going to be a time where you're going to want to either add the hard drive itself that the data lives in. So I can navigate to this folder right here by going D, 24K, T, Taylor Well, Map Elements, and there is my home folder. Well, that was a whole lot of clicking just to get to this project folder. So what we want to do occasionally is 
Sure, it's nice to occasionally, if you're bouncing back between a whole bunch of different projects or you've got uh, multiple projects that you're pulling together to make a compilation, you may want to have the whole hard drive that you're working on added as well. Or in this case, I may just want to have this project's master folder in there. And just like we showed with the style file, you can right click on the folder, add folder connection, it opens up my browser. I'm going to navigate to that TaylorWell project folder now. So I'm going to go D, 24K, T, TaylorWell, oops, TaylorWell, and click OK. Now I've added that. So if I want to add the Hillshade, I can come to Repository Masters. There is my Hillshade. Drag it into my layers, place it at a place that's appropriate. We now have our Hillshade added to our project. Much easier than trying to navigate to data, 24K, T, Taylor Well, repository, rasters, and then there's my raster. Now, and I'm going to make the same warning that I've made with probably most of you over the years. Don't add too many connections to your projects. The more of these that you have, the slower your computer will be for processing that information because it has to index all of these. And technically right now, I now have this, this arc, my home folder indexed three times because I have it here. We saw that I could navigate to here. It's indexed in this directory as well as all of this. Again, another reason why you may not want to connect to an entire hard drive, but your work and your computer horsepower will dictate how much this happens. Or another good example is, oh, sorry, let me finish that statement. And it's also indexed here as well. So that's three instances of this in this project. That is taking resources. While they are currently minor, it is still taking resources. The more of folder connections you have, the more resources you start to steal from yourself trying to do processes. The other thing that is convenient is when I right clicked and added a folder connection, I navigated to TaylorWell and clicked add. I'm going to go ahead and do one thing really quick. I'm going to remove the S drive from the project because what I can also do is add folder connection, navigate to my S drive, and click OK. I've added it back in. What I can also do is right click on those directories that you're always going to access data sets, state map, aquifer mapping program, that AMP folder, W, um, any of your program specific folders that you just, it houses the majority of the things that you need access to. You can go ahead and say, add to new projects. Any new project that you create then will have those folder connections in there. So my recommendation is for your program, add your program specific one and always make it a uh, add to new projects. The other one that's a good one to do that too is the T drive where all of the vast majority I shouldn't say all of, where the vast majority of data sets, geographic features that we use in maps live is in data sets. I understand that data sets is a little disorganized and a mess. I apologize for that. I have plans for that in the future. At some point we'll clean that up, but this is another good one to go ahead and add to new projects. Anytime now, when you make a new project, it opens up. So everyone saw me remove the S drive. Did I add it in when I saved this project? No, because I had it as add to new projects. So there may be some of these things that you go ahead and have just automatically deal with for you so that you don't have to fuss and muss with them later on. Okay, so we've gone through folders and just, like anything else, like you saw, you can right click and uh, remove from the project. This isn't delete, this is remove from the project. So it doesn't show up on your project anymore.
Um, and you can also add favorites as well. I keep forgetting about that. But if you have favorites, those things show up over here. So these are the things that I use periodically. They're not that uh, 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 frequent that I use them, but I have them in my favorites so that I can go and find them a little bit quicker. Uh, again, these are stealing resources as well. So the fact that I have data and state map and data sets in here probably isn't the best idea as having them as favorites by making them a favorite. It's better to go ahead and add them in this way and make them the default, uh, not make them the default, but um, add to new projects. Okay, so that is basically the gist of adding projects adding, sorry, importing an MXD to Pro and saving it as a project. And you'll notice it didn't remove my MXD. I still have access to my MXD. So you can always go back to this and reference this by importing it again. If something got deleted, something got removed, something got broken, you need to figure something out, you can always come back and re-import this MXD. If you open it temporarily, and don't save it, if you close it, you haven't changed a thing. Good, okay. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, and we are getting tight on time, um, I wanted to talk about and touch on licensing and options. So I'm gonna do that again. So I went to project that kicked me back to this tab. In here is the licensing tab. By default, if everything gets set up the way we intend it to be set up on install, you should never have to come in here and do anything with licensing. It should be pre-configured to just let you run. With that being said, it's not uncommon for us to get additional licenses to extensions. So if you currently open this up and you can see that these all say no, it's probably to your behest. It's probably to your best benefit to go ahead and configure your license option. This will take a while to go ahead, ping the license server, find out what's available, because this isn't a process of just paying the license server and saying, okay, yes, I see the license server, give me a license. This actually has to go through and actually read the license for everything that's available. Once it reads those, you can see the date that things expire, and you can see all of the licenses that I have, the extensions that I have authorized our license server to issue to me. So currently I have everything checked except for bathymetry, because we live in New Mexico, I don't deal with bathymetry very much. But this one, and I strongly recommend image analyst, probably don't need spatial analyst if you have the 3D analyst, but I'm just gonna say right off the bat, spatial analyst, image analyst, and 3D analyst, you probably just want to make sure those are turned on. I'm gonna say this for everyone's benefit though, feel free to turn every single one of these on so you can click OK and forget about it from that point on. What this does is if you go to the Spatial Analyst toolbox and you don't have that extension turned on and you try and use one of the tools, it says you are not authorized to use this extension. And it's because you haven't checked an extension out. That's what that process did, is it authorized your computer to check out a copy of the license for that extension. And you can see now that there are certain things that we don't have access to directly and things that we tend not to use. But feel free to just go ahead and turn everything on so that you have access to it. Options. Now, here's where we get into a lot of different settings. As you can see, there's a lot going on here. The one that I really wanted to touch on was units, because I'm not sure how many people use quadrant uh, 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 brunt and compasses anymore. One of the things that you kind of want to do occasionally is you want to you know, start a vertice and then you want to draw a line in a direction. By default, every project 
not the software application, every project's unit for directional units will default to quadrant bearing. There is no way to change this. So that means you will have to type things in using the quadrant bearing notation. It is so much easier if you want to throw a directional at 181 to do north azimuth, click your vertice, right click, say direction, and then type in 181, and then you're done. The notation is much easier to do. So this is one of those gotchas that I recognized very early on that most people use that North Asmuthal 0 to 360 setting. So this is why I wanted to talk about this right off the bat is this makes life so much easier, but you have to do it on every project. That being said, geologic mappers, when we make your projects, I am hoping that my poor little pea-sized brain can remember to set this for you. If my little pea-sized brain can't remember to set this for you, I want you all to know where this is because I know many of you are using this directional function from time to time. So I want you to be aware that North Asmuthal is very different than quadrant bearing, as you know. And this will allow you to very easily set something to a specific direction. There are a lot of settings in here. Um, the other one I wanted to talk about is application specific settings in the general tab in project recovery. Everyone should be delighted at the fact that I said project recovery in pro. Remember when ArcMask map used to crash on you and you haven't saved your MXD, you haven't saved your layer file and you haven't saved your edits in like 15, 20, 30 minutes and those just go away and you have to do them over again? Arc Pro has recovery functionality built in. So currently, mine is set to create a backup when the project has, has unsaved changes, and it saves a backup after this time interval has lapsed five minutes. That means if I've been working for 45 minutes, but I have forgot to click save, if it crashes, I only lose the last five minutes before the save. That to me is like the hugest saving grace in the world. I have never been so happy in my life to switch to pro, to have this backup, to know that my uncommitted edits won't be lost after a half hour of digitizing. So that's one of the key things I wanted to touch on. And the other one I wanted to touch on, and we're out of time, so I'm gonna go over this really quick, is editing. When you started working in ArcMap oh so many years ago or yesterday, to start editing features, to digitize, to edit vertices, to do anything, you had to start an editing session. In Pro, you are inherently dangerous the second you open up Pro because you don't have to start an editing session to start editing data. That means as soon as you open up a project and add data in, you can immediately start editing that data. The reason why I'm going into belaboring this a little bit is because it is dangerous. We have been trained so long that it's so easy to click things outside of an editing session and do whatever you need to do and know that you're not going to affect the data. Now you can affect the data. If you don't want that to be the case in session, you can turn on enable and disable editing from the edit tab this is the editor start editing button if you want this make sure this checkbox is checked i initially turned this on and after a couple of months i was like oh i don't have to do this anymore but you have to accept the responsibility that inherently you are dangerous to your own data as soon as you uncheck this checkbox, especially when automatically save edits is turned on. So automatically save edits is nice too, because again, you're in that editing session, every 10 minutes of editing, it will go ahead and save that editing for you, even if you didn't want to. 
So there's a little, the, those two warnings right there are the caveats of why I wanted to go into this and why I'm bleeding over in time a little bit, because I found that was the first thing that I opened up Arc Pro, started working on things and was like, oh, wow, I can actually just directly start editing data. Wait, I can automatically start editing data. Normally you had the safety check against the system of editor, start editing, and then you can start editing features. By default, if memory serves, this comes in turned off. By default, you will be dangerous in pro, fair warning. Either come in and set this and turn this on, and then you will be safe you will still have to editor start editing and you'll notice that is an application setting which means that once you close the application it'll write that to your settings because there isn't a normal file anymore which bugs me we'll get into that later but now you have the ability to save this setting for your application not for your projects thank you andy for clarifying the difference between a project setting and an application setting Okay, so I was able to cover everything I wanted. I only went over by four and a half minutes, give or take. Um, that's what I wanted to cover in this first lesson. For the most part, I'm probably going to end up covering this same exact information in the next lecture. And the reason why is I feel like people will want to get this down and understand I jammed through that first part really quick of opening the project and doing things and unsetting. And I recognize that it happens really quick. It's really fairly easy, but I don't think comprehension will be there. So if you want to do an exercise, my recommendation is go ahead and if, import a project per what I demonstrated. You will probably have questions. Next week, I will go over the process again. Maybe that will answer those questions. And if not, we have the Q&A session afterwards. So now I want to go ahead and open the floor up to everyone and uh, let's go ahead and uh, if anyone's got questions, let's go ahead and go through them.